Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 50 of, Big the, American, five oh. of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and joining me is my co-host, Pervis Evan. Yes, good to be back. Uh, Ramadan Mubarak to our listeners uh, for those fasting and celebrating, commemorating Ramadan. Uh, we're about what? Recording this at the... At exactly the midway point. That is correct. Time flies. Um, I would imagine that's probably the impression most of the listeners have, too. Can't believe where Ramadan comes and goes. Um, so, yeah, it's been a minute. I know we were supposed to try to drop an episode right at the beginning of Ramadan, but uh, things... That's all right. It was scheduling between me and Zaki, so... Um, and uh, there's been there's lots going on, so lots to sort well, of get well, into. Well, I guess first of all, kind of let's talk about Ramadan. Yeah, how's your Ramadan going, man? It's it's going. I'm you know trying trying to get the the most out of it. Okay. Uh, spiritually. And that means. Uh, I'm still trying is, to figure that out. This yeah, is you a know, confessional. I'm, We're in this. Yeah. yeah, you know, I mean, just just trying to do what you can to. I, honestly, sometimes you know, uh, you know, Ramadan the the. What you're told is do more, do more than than right. you normally do. And I'm finding the hardest thing sometimes is just trying to maintain a baseline of what you are supposed to do. Mm. You know, so reading because that's because you know what tends yeah. to happen is that in everyday life it's like you read a little bit less Quran, yeah. or you you know, and so in Ramadan you're trying to just like sort of get back to situation normal, and and that's sometimes the, the biggest challenge, right? Um, it's almost it's almost like the, the fasting itself is relatively easy compared mm. to compared to that agreed aspect. Agreed, you know? agreed. Although you know, speaking of, I mean, like with regards to the fasting, um, this is probably the longest fast that most of us on the Western Hemisphere is that right? are experiencing, right? Really? Because it's, yeah, it's like we're at the peak of the summer. Sure. So moving forward now, it, it'll only get shorter. Oh, okay. So the, we're hitting that point. And then again, for people, at least in my age bracket, um, <laughs> which let's say forties, early forties, uh, uh, they, I, I, it's kind of like full circle for most of us who started fasting. We started in the summer months wow. and now we've kind of come full circle. And my, my two older kids, they, bla- they passed, uh, this past Sunday, they fasted for the first time. Oh, okay. The two older ones. The two older ones. So they're yeah. 10 and eight. Ten and eight. My, my eight year old was like around eight o'clock. He was... Man, it was like it was like Rocky at the end of his fight with Drago. He's like, just give me some water, and I'm like, home stretch, just hang in there a little bit longer, you know. That's right. Yeah, I think I was about ten. I think it was my first. Uh, but uh, so uh, so, and, and how about the how about the oldest? How did he do? He did all right. Yeah, yeah. It was. It's you know the one thing we take for granted in the Bay Area is how many halal food options mm-hmm. you have. Yeah. And so uh, the nice thing is is. Uh, you know, as a treat, we were like, you guys, we can get whatever you want for dinner. Yeah. And uh, we have Wayback Burger here. Oh, yeah. So throwing in a plug for Wayback Burger. But that's my, my tenure. He's like, I want Wayback Burger. And I just thought, you know, the cool thing is, like, they have these halal options that they're yeah. a, a well-versed in, they're familiar with, and that they have an affinity for, mm-hmm. which is pretty awesome. I mean, yeah. you know, when, when we were younger, the halal option was like, well, that's what we can eat. Yeah. But it was, it was rarely the preferred option. True, true, you know? true. True. It's like homemade fried chicken versus KFC, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Right, right. No, I think, that, yeah, there's certainly a lot more options. And, 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 you know, referring to as far as, like, letting the kids eat whatever, you know, allowing them to treat. So um, my my older one obviously fasts every day. But even for her, we're just kind of like, you know what, you know, get yourself a treat, like, you know, several times a week. You know, we will usually order in or... Let her get ice cream or something, you know, just to, just to kind of, yeah, just to, just to keep it light and, 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 uh, at least giving them something to, some enjoy. incentive, some incentive. I mean, not that again, she's been doing it for a couple of years now. Sure. She doesn't need it, but, um, yeah, just, just to make it special and fun and, you know, yeah, as well, like the actual breaking of the fast, you know, so, uh, but yeah, I, I, going back to what you were saying, it's, it's, yeah, it's, 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 um, I don't know. It just, it's so weird. Like this Ramadan is just, I feel like it's really just flown by and so I haven't really had a chance to kind of really reflect on things but um, I, I think we also kind of take for granted that feeling hungry like just the hunger and thirst that we experience not take for granted but we, we almost treat that as well that's going to happen inevitably in Ramadan 
um, we treat it kind of as an eventuality. But I think even in that, just the fact that you are hungry or that you are thirsty is in and of itself a reflection on what this month is all about or what it's meant to be all about, which is to deprive oneself of even those things that are natural and part of life and permissible and enjoyable and other parts of the year. But this time, in, you know, it's, it's the moment of Ramadan where we even deprive ourselves uh, of those things um, as a reflection, I think, of um, that, as a reflection of many things, but among them, I think, is the fact that sometimes deprivation or sometimes uh, preventing yourself from being satiated or satisfied is that there's a lesson there. Yeah. There's a profundity there and there's something to reflect upon there. I, and I think that that, you know, it's just like, because regardless of where you are in your fasting and what I mean by that is, you know, we, some people, we, we get in, like in our, in Muslim tradition, there's the idea of, well, there's the fast of the body, which is the hunger and thirst. Then there's the mental fast where you are only devoted mentally and you're only reflecting on God and thinking of God and so on. And then there's sort of the higher stations, like the spiritual fast, which is to, 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 to deprive oneself of thinking of anything else besides God and devotion and so on. Forget where, let, let's say forget, regardless of where you are in terms of your, where you, where one thinks they are spiritually in this mm -hmm. month, the bottom line is you're going to experience hunger and thirst. So I think that the reason I call attention to that is because let's not, don't just treat that as an eventuality. I, I think that there's, yeah. that there's something that deep. in and of itself is an important thing. to Thank do you. Work. Thank you. That's what I'm saying. Because, you know, it's about, you know, deprivation of what we say in the Arabic or in the Muslim tradition, the nafs, right? The ego, the, the, the base appetites. So, uh, food, hunger, sex, sex, Th those are base appetites and, and, and what we're trying to teach ourselves in this month in this sort of crucible of a month is, or this boot camp, which is like, let's deprive that part of our, of our being. Not that we're going to kill it off. You're never going to kill off the ego. You're never going to kill off the base desires, but you can suppress them. Mm. You can tame them. And so the idea is to sort of tame those things. And, and I think this is also why, for example, in, in, in Muslim tradition and according to prophetic teaching, you know, it's said that the demonic forces and say the satanic forces are closed, are, are chained, right? Mm -hmm. In the month of Ramadan and they're locked up. And so to, again, to me, that's, you obviously you, 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 you take it at face value and you can, you take it figure or you take it literally, but let's say, you know, I think that even if we reflect on that, what does that leave you then with? If, if all of those external forces that are of temptation are supposedly chained up, then what are you left with? You're left with your own inner desires, your own, that, that, that ego again, that own nafs, um, the base desires that we have. And so, you know, that's what we're, so you, 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 you're we're focusing on. You're seeing the kind of person you are. That's right. That's right. So, yeah. So to me that those are, I think, you know, I, I think that everyone experiences that. And I think that's sort of a universal experience among those who are fasting. So, which is, again, why I kind of sort of call attention well, to Well, uh, I mean, with that in mind, I yeah. mean, we're, we're talking in, in context of obviously a lot of uh, real-world events happening. And then in, in the past uh, uh, few weeks, th there was a uh, terror attack in London, mm -hmm. in Ramadan. Yeah, been, yeah, there's been a couple. And then, of course, the horrific one is in, in, in Afghanistan, which killed like 150 people, not getting a lot of... No, you know, not as much news coverage of yeah, that. Yeah, sadly. But uh, I mean, how, how do we how do we reconcile that? In turn, I mean, obviously for us, it's easy to be like, well, these people are, are awful and horrible. But I mean, unfortunately, uh, the picture that's being painted is, well, this is the month of spiritual devotion, and this is what Muslims do when they're spiritually mm. devoted. Yeah. Wow. Uh, that's a tough one. So do, do you mean, how do we reconcile that? I don't think you mean... Not, not as Muslims, but how, how do we frame... Oh, okay, frame, so you mean that. I mean, the... the, the I, I, I thought you weren't talking about the, 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 um, the, uh, what am I trying to say? The, um, optics of it, or you mean specifically I, I, the optics I, I, I of it. I am talking about the optics yeah. of it. Yeah, because, yeah. because I, I'm, I'm not trying to reconcile that for me, that what these evil people do has nothing to do with my conception of my faith. Right. But 
I am thinking about optics, right? Because outside looking in, this is just, you know, I mean, the, the, unfortunately, there's a commingling mm. in sort of the, the global narrative that a faith, an observant Muslim equals yeah, doing true. this stuff. Doing right? this stuff, true. Uh, and, and we can obviously get into how problematic those yeah. linkages are, whatever. They exist, though, right? So, so in other words, this is not a situation of don't bind me with those chains. The chains are already there. Exactly. Which then, I would then begin to sort of respond to that by saying then, that I don't know how, I don't know, I don't know if we can change the optics or address the optics of it. I mean, I think that, because if people have already bought into that narrative, it's, it's really hard to change that perception because of what's happening yeah. geopolitically all sure. over the world. It just val- it, it just continues to validate that worldview. If you if you perceive Islam and Muslims within that lens, I I, I it, it has become increasingly hard pressed to, to 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 turn those people away from that narrative just because again almost every day in the news that somehow gets validated and reinforced. Yeah, and so you know. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think, but from a, a certain point of view, or, or one, one way of address, not addressing it, but one way I want to sort of frame that, the idea of the optics of it is, is that, look, these are people who, meaning these, the people who carry out these acts, the, 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 the terrorists who are engaged in this sort of, in, these, in this kind of behavior and actions, to them, they've already come to terms with the fact, or they've already, for them, the approach is, let's, how do we, how do we inflict as much damage as possible, hmm. human or otherwise? And they also don't make, they don't draw a lot of distinction between whether you're a Muslim or non-Muslim or whether you're or a person of other faith or whether you're, what kind of Muslim you are. It's just... If you are against them, you exa- are... That's yeah. right. Your blood is licit. So meaning that you, anything goes, you, you know, and so you're just, again, collateral damage. And so then if you've, so if you've gone down that precipice of, well, you know what, I'm going to try to inflict as much damage as possible. Well, then from a strategic, from a strategy point of view, and again, I hate to kind of get, I mean, it's, it's icky getting into the mind of a terrorist, but let, you know, for a moment here, Ramadan is a time where generally speaking, you know, you're going to find crowds of Muslims that are out and about either during the day or certainly in the evening, um, certainly from a you know, from a, uh, uh, I guess, from an optics of, uh, you know, doing something in Ramadan that's going to certainly call attention to what, you know, whatever political motive that you have, and it's going to become significant because it is Ramadan. But do you know what I mean? Uh, yes, but but we can't divorce from what you're saying, the fact that these people ostensibly consider themselves Muslims and thus thus ascribe a spiritual component to what they're doing. For sure. So for them... So what's the... How do they thread that needle? Well, for, again, if, if you've already gone down the precipice of, well, the, 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 the lives and the, and the, and the property and, and the sanctity... If you're already like, I am righteous in what I'm doing. Exactly. Then and, yes. okay. and, these, and these people that I'm, that I'm going to target... Their blood is licit, or that they are they, they, they their property and their lives are can be expendable. Then, um, then, then, if you're already within that sort of framework, approaching things, then yeah, then it just becomes it's not too far of a of a um, of a uh, journey, I guess. You know, it's not too far. It's not the next step. Then is to sort of say, well, in Ramadan. All good devotional acts are rewarded exponentially. I mean, this is what again Muslims believe. So it's like, well, if I'm if I'm righteous in doing this, then why not get the most reward? Hmm. As perverse as that is, the, that the, that's their approach from a both a strategic point of view, as I was some of the things I was saying early on, but also from a quote unquote, you know, really parenthetically, a quote unquote spiritual sense. For them, this is devotion. This is how, you know, yeah. So, again, as perverse as that sounds. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because obviously the attacks in London happened and London has a Muslim mayor, right? And this, yeah. is, this is, you know, for an extraordinary 
place to be at in in yeah. in the world where Certainly. you know first Muslim ma- mayor of a major Western capital and he's he's articulate he's yeah. he's uh, very sharp he's mm-hmm. very politically savvy and so naturally he is the sworn enemy of the current president of the United States right and and it's kind of interesting to to the fact that uh, the mayor of London happens to be you know ha- has to uh, Pick up the pieces, so to speak, in, in the wake of this attack, and and very shortly thereafter, President Trump, yeah. uh, you know, is criticizing him, and and you know, you have to wonder. Well, if his name was not Sadiq Khan and he was not a brown person, would he be criticizing him? Absolutely not. Yeah, and and it the I don't know. You know, it's it's a really interesting place to be at where you have to wonder if uh, can we imagine a situation where Tony Blair. Uh, gave a statement critical of Rudy Giuliani after September 11th, right? Because that would be well, the exact corollary. I, mean, it, I, I don't know if we're going to full fledged go Trump right now uh, in terms of the. the hey, we didn't say we're fasting from that. So. <laughs> what we want to talk about, but this is one indulgence. We, we continue. I mean, at least I. Uh, this is how I feel. I don't know how you feel, Zaki. We haven't talked a lot about this, but no. every day I find myself in uncharted territory with yeah. this man. It is exhausting. That's like, the one thing. That we're, we're, to to your point about Trump being critical of Sadiq Khan, like. You, it's ne- I think never he just doesn't like people it. named Khan. That's my theory. Because about a year ago, he did the same thing with what? Hizr Khan. Oh, yeah, that's right. He just doesn't like the... <laughs> Khan! <laughs> I saw that meme, right? Um, no, but... Like, you would never imagine a Western... I mean, the, the President of the United States going after an ally of ours, yeah. being critical of an ally of ours, during not, a time of distress, not just after a For tra- something he didn't say. That's right. Taking him out of context... No, deliberately taking him out of context because yeah. you have to be deliberate to take out. You know, what was it like? He, he essentially yeah. said. So, so the actual quote that was, said, Look, said, there's, there's going to be a lot of police activity. Increased police activity. So don't be alarmed. Don't be alarmed. So instead, the terrorist attack happens, and he says, "Don't be alarmed," which is, I mean, that's what I mean. It, it's deliberate. So now, let me ask you this: um, since we're we, we got into the icky minds of terrorists, so. <laughs> Not to say, but anyway, let's let's get into the mind of Donald Trump for a second. I'll just I'll just say that. Um, I, I I used to think that it was pure theatrics, and this was all him, you know, giving red meat to his fan base. So you thought he was smarter than he was coming off? Yeah, really. But where are we now? Like, where are you now? And I don't know. And I'm exactly and you, where I was a year ago. Okay, which is is this? No, what I mean is like, for example. Him, like you said, selecting that portion of Sadiq Khan's statement, that is not... I, I'm saying it's, it, 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 it was deliberate. Well... So it's not incompetence. I, I, I think that... No, see, I... It's not senility. I, it's I'm, not incompetence. No, I'm, I'm willing to wager that he saw something on Fox News where they, they uh, snipped it out of context, and he of course. he's not a sophisticated person. I think, I think any... No, you know, one thing they used to say about President Obama all the time, even people were disappointed, they say, you know, uh, you, you got to play the long game with Obama. He's playing chess, everyone else playing checkers. Yeah. And, and, you know, uh, people will say, oh, you're just uh, you know, bending over backwards for Obama. I think Obama is very smart politically. Uh, I, I don't think he won every battle, but I think if we're talking about purely political optics, the truth is that he left office hugely popular. Yeah. Why? Because I think he accomplished a lot of good things, and and uh, you know I think a lot of Trump supporters will reflect to go, oh well, you know he's playing checkers, everyone else is playing checkers. Uh, I don't think that's the case. I think I think everyone is playing checkers, and he's playing Connect Four. You know, it's he's. He's doing so. He's Candyland, you know. Yeah. It's, it's I, I. I think he's a remarkably unsophisticated person, <laughs> right? You know, to to I like that to an extraordinary degree. And and yeah. the truth is that I, my, the impression I have had of Donald Trump throughout my life has never once been thrown into doubt, which is that he's a showman who yeah. sort of, you know, he he is what you see. That's right. And Magla, yeah, Mangle Maniac. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, there was a time when when The Apprentice was hugely popular. I used to watch The Apprentice. I never watched it because I liked Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. I thought that the sort of the drama of the show was was uh, you know it was pretty amusing. I wouldn't say it was compelling, but it was definitely amusing. Right? But uh-huh. I never was. I, I I would watch that show. We're talking you know twelve thirteen years ago. Yeah. I'm like, why would you want to work for this guy? Mm. 
Like, you know what I mean? Like, uh, just hit yourself on the head with a with a with a cast iron mallet because uh, it just it. He seems like an unpleasant person, right? You know, right. and and you know he was wedded to this persona of himself, and it's it's one of those things because I talk about this in my class all the time. It's we our our social uh, our social norms are based on sort of collective agreement. Right. Right. So you and I, we act a certain way b- throughout our lives yeah. based on what is deemed acceptable by right. people around us. So if you are, you know, uh, wealthy to a degree greater than people around you and their livelihood depends on uh, giving approval to you, well, you're never going to butt up against those kind of social norms being violated. Mm, Does see. that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So if I'm like, hey, Pervis, you're stupid. I hate you. Right. You're dumb, right? And then and then you give me this look, like, oh, and right, and and I'm like, oh, I just said something right. cruel. Now, ideally, if I say that to him, it's not right now as a nearly forty year old adult. It's as like a five year old, and I. That's you know that's how we learn. That's how we learn. That's how we learn not to be a horrible person. Now here's somebody yeah. who who he can say whatever he wants. I mean, th- this is the thing, right? Like I, I'm not going to sit here. Uh, nearly a year after the election and say, oh, he's doing this and that. Like every, this is not like, oh my gosh, look at all the stuff that's coming out. Yeah. Everything that's happening now, we knew. Yeah. It, it, what's past <laughs> is prologue. Right? Yeah. So so I, I just sit here and I'm like, well, look, uh, you know, this is what people wanted. Right? Mm-hmm. The analogy I've made before is like there was that, the TV miniseries V. Have you ever seen V? Of course. With the, the, the space lizards who are fascists, right? Yes. The big thing. They show up and they're like, hey, we're... Because we're, we're, they, they look human. Like, oh, we're, we're here to help you and we're going to do all this stuff. Was the first show... Was the first series called V or Visitors? It was just V. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, they're, they're wearing human disguises. Yeah. And then the whole thing is like, actually, they're evil lizard monsters who want to eat us. This is like, hey, I'm an evil lizard monster that wants to eat you. And people are like, oh, okay, I want to vote for you. That's what this is like. The, the, what, what, the most unbelievable thing about V was that they had to disguise who they were. Yeah. Because this is it, it, what, what we think of as a bug, his supporters think of as a feature. So, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. I right. mean, we're at that point where... It's, we're, it, again, they voted for him not in spite of that, but because yeah, of that. Yeah, that's what they wanted. So, so with that in mind, I'm kind of at the point where it's like, well... There's no changing the minds of anybody whose mind has not been changed at this point. I mean, it's like, what do you need, right? And I think we're, in terms of his base, we're only seeing a nominal uh, change in people in buyer's remorse, yeah, yeah, as it and, were. And it's right, uh, nominal to the point where it's, right. it's. We talked about this even with the episode with Wajahat, and I don't think much has changed since then. Yeah, I mean, what's the at take? that point, it was like three percentage points. And and, yeah. and why? Because look how the the landscape has changed. Uh, the unequal landscape in terms of how information is disseminated. Absolutely. Right. Another, you know, one of the, and again, you know, you, if you're reading Slate online, like Slate magazine, I mean, that's obviously, you know, you know what you're getting, right? It well, le- leans left. It leans left again, yeah. To, yeah. But one of the one, one of the things that they do, which I do enjoy, I think they do this weekly or every now and then. They, well, they especially do this every now, every well, which is now it is weekly or every other day where there's something big happens or there's some sort of something politically going on, uh, which is that how the how the the right wing media quote unquote funnels that same information. Yeah. So, for example, now, I mean, you know, or right now we, we, we sit days after the Comey hearings, which were on, what, Thursday, Friday? Yeah. Um, and uh, the Comey hearing uh, before the Senate um, uh, and, and how the right wing was able to, or the right wing media, and I'm talking about Fox News, Breitbart, um, you know, uh, what else is out there? Um, what's his name? Drudge Report. I mean, there's so many, right? Um, how how they how, how they are responding to that? Um, uh, how, like what snippets they take from the uh, Comey hearing, as opposed to let's say quote unquote the mainstream media, or certainly the media that leans left. But you're right. To your point, that's how information. That's how his base is consuming information. And I would say whether it's every political scandal, whether it was about the trip overseas, what happened with the Comey hearing, all of those things are being, you know, transmitted and being packaged within that. Yeah, yeah I mean, narrative. well, I, I think 
you know, if, if you were to look at, for example, 20 years ago, you had the, the Clinton impeachment stuff going on, mm-hmm. right? And, and you look at something like that and you say, well, why is it that the public never really turned against President Clinton in, in <laughs> large numbers, right? He was still very popular because, because there was still a sense of like, well, these are the facts. The facts are the facts. And, and, you know, Fox News was just in its infancy mm-hmm, then, mm-hmm. you know? And, and, I mean, the media landscape was substantially different. Yes. And I think we're at a point now, I mean, this is something we've talked about before, but I don't think we're ready as a society to deal with the huge negative consequences of sort of anything goes information sharing uh, that we're in now thanks to social media because mm-hmm. people have lost... The, the ability to critically determine what does and does not constitute a credible source. And, and, and you know, a, a friend of mine brought up a point where he, he made a fascinating argument where he put this on smartphones. Okay. I mean, how did we used to consume the internet, right? You would sit ah, at the computer, right. Yeah. and you would, right? Yeah. And so there was sort of a filtration effect in terms of who was accessing information and consuming, right? Because you, you you have to have a certain amount of uh, education level, et cetera, desire, et cetera, access, to access all right, these things, right. right? So so there's sort of there's a lot of filters that are being applied there. Exactly. Economic, right? Uh, um, education, et cetera, interest, True. right? And and that presupposes a, a degree of knowledge about what and is and is not quote unquote real news. And there was still a problem with fake news then too. Sure. Okay. So now. One thing that happens is is the prevalence of social media, okay? And that creates its own set of challenges. But then, no. smartphones become extremely prevalent, and the way we access information... It's true. Everybody has a smartphone. Mm-hmm. And as our phones get smarter, we get dumber. So, you look at a news story on, on your phone, oh, yeah, cool, and you just share it. You don't even read... Sometimes you don't even read the article. Mm-hmm. Usually, you're not even checking the source, mm-hmm. right? And and this stuff disseminate. It's a finger click away from being disseminated thousands of th- times, millions mm-hmm. of times, etc. And so, you know, look at the the result of that, right? We we have, I mean, we the president is like your, you know, the 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 uncle who gets drunk on Thanksgiving and starts talking about you know all them foreigners, right? right. So, I mean, we just we. I think somebody else called him a, 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 the internet comment section. Yeah, right. right. I mean, so, so all these factors come into play. And, and so when we look at what happened this past election, it's like, well, we can, we can blame Hillary Clinton and we can blame this and that. It, essentially, it was like 10 things would have had to happen for Donald Trump to get elected. And wouldn't you know, yeah. all 10 of those things happened. One of them, a big one being the, the, the hackers, who we presume are Russian. Yeah. They saw that weakness, man. I think you posted this article about, which I found fascinating and, or very insightful as well, which was... Oh, that, political, I think, right? Yeah, the political article about how Donald Trump is a manifestation of the, basically, the demise of the... Or not, no, it is the result of yeah. the Republican Party being what it is. Yeah, the, well, in, in essence, the, the Republican Party did not have enough safeguards That's what it is. to stop something like That's this. That's right. That's right. And, 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 and the article poses the question, like, what what about the next Trump? You know, man, I've been saying yeah. this for, I don't know. And, and the, it's a fascinating article. One, I think, if you, you know, definitely check it out. But it also, I mean, it, and what I've been by, it's not usually the, it's not the kind of analysis of the Republican Party that one often hears about, you know, about the base and all that kind of stuff. It gets into, like, for example, their approach to primaries and how it was winner take all. And yeah. Really gets into the sort of the, the 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 nuts and bolts of how the republic the mechanics of the yeah. of the Republican uh, Party with both the primary as well as the uh, the uh, yeah uh, obviously some of the things that we we do often read about which is the analysis of sort of where the party has gone politically and and the party yeah. is gone that's <laughs> I mean it I the mean, the, the, yeah the, the thing the thing that I've been saying all along is. Wow. Uh, first of all, a couple things, right? Every worst case scenario that you sort of thought of when he got elected, you're like, oh my gosh, this is going to happen. This is, it's happening. It's yeah. happening right now. And that's not me being alarmist. That's me telling you the facts, right? That's right. However, uh, and I think we, we talked about this a little bit, <laughs> I think the resiliency of institutional 
pushback has has somewhat surprised me a little bit. However, this is not the end, right? And what I've said all along is I don't worry as much about Donald Trump as I worry about who comes after Donald Trump. It was, essentially, whoever comes next has had the opportunity to, to, to stake out the neighborhood and and see all the weaknesses, the structural weaknesses, right? Correct. Because so this this presidency is in essence a stress test for the U.S. government. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so and the fact that we have an incompetent administration and an incompetent president yeah. is in fact a blessing in disguise for now. Because, because how long will he be incompetent? That's number one. One or two. The next Donald Trump, right? Like you said, the the one who, who the one who's taken out the neighborhood right what now. What happens when you have a charismatic? guy who knows exactly how to use the levers of power and who realizes hey look this is there's a lot of stuff we can get away with because 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 so much of the presidency we realize is it, it's it's kind of interesting right mm-hmm. because because the notion of haya as as a, a a driving thing that that governs our social interactions right so, 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 so i think what you mean it's like so some muslim morality yeah Predicated on this idea of shame, and, like for us, yeah. shame is a part of faith. Yeah, that's and right. and not shame like you know being embarrassed or everything, but just like no, no. the sense of just be decent, be, be, have a sense and awareness. Right. Like like the sociologists say that there 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 are cultures that are based on shame and there are guilt cultures. So sure, they, you know, so so we are a culture based on shame, right? Where you don't do certain things because you know it's going to violate. Right sort of social it's, it's, norms. And it, and it's, it doesn't look good. And it doesn't look good, exactly. Right? And yeah. so you realize like, the institution of the presidency... It's is like going, Hassan Minhaj's... I don't know if you've seen Homecoming King. It. Oh, it. you got to watch it. But it's one of the things... The tagline... What are people going to say? That's right. Anyway, sorry. You were saying... But it's kind of... I mean, that's what the presidency... Uh-huh. What we're realizing now is reliant a lot on. Like, because you assume yeah. that the, whoever is going to somehow end up... Mm-hmm. Who's going to go through this American Gladiator-style obstacle course and end up there... Will have enough of a sense of shame. Well, this doesn't look good, so I'm not going to do it. Mm. Right? And, well... It, somehow, the Founding Fathers never accounted for a completely shameless person wow. get, getting to this point. I mean, it's extraordinary. It's like, it's it's the exhaust port about EY e- that, you know, yeah. made it into the Death Star planes. Right. Right? Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's where we're at. And it's it's mind-boggling because because what I said at the beginning of our conversation, it's exhausting because you wake up in the morning yeah. and I don't know about you, I checked yeah, the news. Literally, recently, yeah. And you just want to go back to sleep. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And and the the really uh, crazy part is that, you know... So what do you think happens now? So, okay, we've, I mean, we, we get into this and, and we just, we could go on. We really could. What happens now? Like, what is the fault? Like, what happens... After the Comey hearings, what 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 are some of the things well, that you I, see happen? I mean, I think I think the the special investigation is continuing, and yeah. I, th- I think also we as a society have sort of become conditioned to like the law and order model of of justice, which is like forty five minutes. We'll wrap this up. No, it's going to take a while. Yeah, and I think that I don't doubt for a second that there are people in government who are dedicated to to exposing wrongdoing which I'm confident is there I think yeah I, 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 you know what I mean I don't think you can be Donald Trump and not be doing shady stuff I think you know I mean I, I just you know so, so uh, to me yeah. it's not a question of like oh it's a, they're just trying to scapegoat it no I think they're going to find something you just have to give them room and I think it's going to happen um, however what I've been saying all along is I worry more about the unforeseeables for example I truly feel that if if a nine eleven esque event were mm-hmm. to happen, God forbid, or something much to a much lesser yeah. uh, degree of intensity, uh, I want I, you know I, I'm reminded. I'm sure you remember the way the the country rallied around President Bush, mm-hmm. who you know, gosh, if if ever there was a thing where you're like, man, George W. Bush, what a what a guy, you know? What a statesman. Yeah, you know? <laughs> but that's the weird thing, because I yeah. never once thought of George W. Bush as an evil person. I thought I saw he, people that he surrounded him, some of the people... I, I thought he was surrounded with some very, very sinister people, but I never yeah. looked at George W. Bush as a bad person. True. I, I, I'll agree. Oh, yeah. You know? I, I, I thought I, he was I ignorant. Yeah. I thought he was ignorant. Yeah. And, but I never thought... You know what I mean? I know. Whereas, whereas that's... I mean, you know... And it's very hard, because I'm somebody... Who really? I truly do believe that you respect the office. 
I, I, I do believe that. And this is a very big challenge I'm having is like, I do respect the office of the presidency. I don't respect the occupant of the office. How do we, so, so how do we, mm-hmm. it's cognitive dissonance, you know? Yeah. Um, but I, wor- I worry about, God forbid, the kind of event that would galvanize support for the president. Mm-hmm. But the other, the corollary to that, I, I wonder if that is even possible with this president. And not just with this president, but with the times we live in. Because because we're, we're talking about the media culture. It's a very, very different media landscape than it was 16 years ago. Well, I hope you're right. I mean, to me, the only sort of crack in that is I remember the because, day because, after... Because, it, because here's the thing. Yeah. And I'll let you get back to it. Yeah. But I don't think anybody before September 11th... It, I don't think George W. Bush before September 11th was under any a cloud anything remotely like what we're seeing here, right? Sure. I think I think people were kind of like tolerating George W. Bush. Correct. And they assumed, well, he's just going to keep right. on keeping and on. And it was a polarizing election, much like this it, last one. It was, but... but it, but, but, like you're saying, yeah, there wasn't I mean, this sort I mean, of cloud. It, it wasn't... And, and it wasn't a, 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 a self-inflicted cloud. Because mm-hmm. really, I mean, Donald Trump from day two of his presidency has been... You know, he yeah. can't get out of his own way. Exactly. And I can't draw a corollary to George W. Bush in the same way. No way. I mean, he, he was like regular right wing. Right. Which... And it was... And again... I have issues with. They had a, they had appointed key positions in the government. They ran a relatively competent yeah. administration. Uh, you know, but... Yeah, this is something that we've never. Heard. I mean, but that's what I, I do worry about yeah. that, you know. But the I, only, and and, and his me, response to mm-hmm. the London thing tells me, gosh, you know, like it's like he he's true. So it's like my he's, only he's concern excited, again is you know? again so much has happened. It's it's it really is is hard to sort of remember everything. But if you think back to after the bombing in Syria, that he like after the military strike, right uh, at the air base. Uh, and so people were like, oh, it's so presidential. It's so presidential. Sure. And people were, there was a little bit of a rally. I don't want to say rallying, but you even had, yeah, I mean, Brian Williams was uh, how the, describing the beauty of these. He's like, I was on the ground watching. Like, <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I fired the missiles myself. It was great. Um, you know what I mean? That concerns me. I mean, it. it that there is it, still an appetite for that. It. That it concerns me to an extent because because I mean if you would have told me a year I would have been like I, obviously America's smarter than this there's no way we're gonna elect Donald Trump so here we are so right. what the, we're we're you know in a long dark tunnel as it is right but I don't know you know I I I, I don't know you know because because it, I don't think it's a question of will something happen because something there will be a an event. Whether we're talking about something like Pulse nightclub or whatever, I mean, it's, there's, that's not a question, right? It's mm-hmm. it's how will he react to an inevitable thing that is going to happen? Correct, right? And I, I want to be very clear about what I'm saying here. It it doesn't take. It could be something like the the Fort Hood shooting. Or, I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it doesn't matter, right? The the scope. It of doesn't it. have to be on the scale of something like yes. the subway attacks yeah. in London or it, that's exactly right, right? or nine right. eleven. I mean, frankly, even what happened on London Bridge, right? I mean, right. it was, you know, just a couple of people doing, like, yeah, I mean. So so when the inevitable thing happens, quote the unquote. The scale of it is. What like, will the scale, regardless of the scale of the, the event, what event. is the scale of the reaction going That's to be? That's right. And, and based on the fact that, you know, uh, 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 Meryl Streep criticized him and he went to DEF CON 1, well, you know, I mean, uh, we should be concerned, right? That's so, almost like a deep cut now. Again, because... It's exhausting. 160 days into this administration, yeah. so much has happened. It's true. That, that, that almost feels like... Back wow. in the day, like <laughs> two months ago, Meryl Streep criticized Donald Trump, and oh my gosh. <laughs> right. And it's funny, because right, the Comey thing, people like checking his Twitter. He hasn't tweeted yet. He yeah. hasn't tweeted yet, you know? Right, right. And that's the bar we're at. That's it. So so it's like, well, we can, we can say... The one thing I say again and again, we have to be... Really bear in mind that this is not normal and we cannot normalize it. Can but you know what? It's, it's going to become normalized uh, because there's going to be a whole generation of people that grow up thinking this is normal. Mm. And and there's no mechanism in, in the government that's particularly uh, invested in, in uh, denormalizing it. You know? I mean, honestly, like, Donald Trump is Donald Trump. Yeah. But... 
Paul Ryan, what's your excuse? Like, Mitch McConnell, what's your... You represent the government. You don't represent the president. Like, don't you care about what you're leaving in your wake? Like, it, that's that's what blows my mind, right? Well, uh, to me, as... Like, Paul as Ryan makes you for John the, No, I agree with you. And as disturbing as the Republican Party, and like you said, where the Republican Party... That the party is gone, as you said moments ago. As much as I agree with everything there, where's the Democratic response? Well, I mean, I th- I, yeah, I mean, where that that to me, is, I think, there's still this vacuum. Well, I think the vacuum stems from the fact that they ran a fundamentally flawed candidate, and they were they willed themselves into not realizing that she had some very real flaws, and that's fully acknowledging that she got more votes than him. Mm-hmm. But she was the second least popular candidate to ever run for the presidency. Most the uh, the most least unpopular, mm-hmm. Donald Trump. That's a problem, right? Because what I'm saying is, like, there's no formidable opposition but because we're it's by virtue, you know, but for the I mean ineptitude of this administration, yeah. but for the who's know, on deck, nobody exactly, They're but right. for the fact that we've we we have a FBI director who was fired and then testified before, yeah, Congress. and these are all but for us, wounds. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. He can't get out of his own way, yeah. but. But yet, so all where we find ourselves now is by virtue of those things. I agree. Not by virtue of any formidable opposition to him. Yes. Uh, and that's what's concerning. That is deeply concerning to me. We should be concerned. Yeah, I mean, there, there's no one on the on the bench. I mean, 2017, we're, we're here. We're in the middle of 2017. 2018 is a is are the midterms. Yeah, so, I mean, game theory, I think what you're going to see is a lot of fresh faces running for Congress in 2018. You're going to see a lot of people who... Um, both parties? On, uh, no, on the, yeah, on the Democratic, the Democratic side. side. Right? The Republicans are going to be playing defense. I think there's a lot... Because because what you're going to see, if I were to guess, is a lot of Democrats uh, trying to compete in in previously sort of, quote-unquote, safe red district. Okay. So that's a good thing, potentially. Right? True. True. Um, however, if you're looking at the, the, the presidential bench, I don't know, man. You know, the, the honestly, first of all, I think Bernie Sanders is a non-starter. Please yeah. go ahead, send your hate mail. Okay, I'm so I'm, oh Bernie would have won. No, Bernie would have lost too. Uh, I said this on the previous show. Um, I, I I don't know. I don't know who's on the bench. You know, the the only thing I can think of is, and, and not because I necessarily think he, uh, he's the right choice, but I could see somebody like Joe Biden coming forward. Mm. And and doing essentially for the country what Jerry Brown did for California, mm. because Jerry Brown, for those of you who don't know, as we were served about, as yeah. he served as governor during I think it was the eighties, right? Correct, or maybe no, was it the seventies? No, 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 it was that. He was after Reagan. Yeah, he was. He was after Reagan. It was eighties or even early nineties? Because remember, he even had a failed presidential bid. That was right. ninety-two. So it would have been probably mid to late. 80s, then, yeah. correct? Because by '92 he ran for president. That's right. He, was, he ran you know, for Governor Moonbeam. Right. Yeah. They called him because he was like far to the left, and, ah, yeah. and he was this young, charismatic guy. Okay. Uh, and he was, you know, he was very popular. And and then, um, it, you know, after he left office, we had various governors in California. We had Arnold Schwarzenegger, who, again, when you talk about the, the wheel of time, here, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Now we're like, man, you know, I wish he was president, you know, <laughs> but he he. He was yeah. sort of disastrous for California Correct. as a governor. And so we had this little, you know, experiment, the Schwarzenegger experiment. Mm-hmm. And then he leaves, and Jerry Brown, who's now 20 years older, yeah. and he's like, look, his, his whole campaign was like, okay, let me come in and just do the job. I'm going to keep my head down. You're not going to hear about me. I'm just going to do the job. And and he's been great for California. Yeah. You right. know? And so I can see a scenario where Joe Biden could run on that kind of a platform, and I, I would argue he would be a much more effective uh, uh, advocate for mm-hmm. specific Democratic ideas. He would also hearken back to an era that not that long in the past that suddenly people have a whole lot more nostalgia for, it, which is the Obama era. In other words, I would argue, in other words, I would argue that Good Joe point. Biden is a much better heir to the Obama legacy than Hillary Clinton ever was. Oh, for because, sure. Because I think the fundamental miscalculation was that. A vote for the first woman president would be enough to to put her over the edge. I think Mm. think the Democrats fundamentally miscalculated how much resentment there was for Hillary Clinton. And I want to be clear about this. Maybe a third of that was, was, uh, was, uh, you know, just 
fiction by virtue right. of propaganda and yeah. fiction yeah. Like, there, I'm not doubting the lifetime of service that she put in I, I also don't think she would have been a bad president yeah however I think that Obama too I think President Obama misinterpreted the fact that oh, Joe Biden would have been somebody who who was able to grab hold of the Obama legacy in a much clearer cleaner way yeah. than than Hillary Clinton who had to sort of be the the spokesperson for the advocate for the Obama legacy while also have to fight off all the crap she did. I mean, I just finished listening to the audiobook of this book, Shattered. Oh, yeah, we've been hearing about that. Yeah, it was fantastic. It's about the Clinton campaign, and man, you just sort of shake your head. Right. You know, it's it's worth, if you haven't uh, read it or listened to it, I highly recommend that. Uh, in terms of, obviously, we're, we don't want to get too far into the weeds and just make this purely political, but when you talk about the media conversation, uh, Reza Aslan, who's oh, yeah. just as pissed off yeah. as we are, uh, he took it to, to Twitter, and he, he uh, this was after the London attacks, yeah. when President Trump was going after Saleh Khan, mm-hmm. and Reza Aslan, who hosts a show on CNN, which I have not seen, but it's called Believer. I have yet to see a single episode. Um, I thought it was about Justin Bieber. I thought it was called Believer. So I was like, ah, it's not really for me. <laughs> Well, maybe it is. For so it's believe and I, all. Yeah, all I saw was people reacting to the show, and you know, and, and, and reacting to the show and to him, and to him, and, correct, and um, the sort, and so that's all I've. Yeah. So right. so Reza Aslan tweets. He he calls President Trump a piece of s word, mm-hmm. and so I saw that tweet, and I was like, he's going to lose his job. Mm. And then a few days later, CNN was like, thanks, but no thanks, we're not doing a second season of Believer. And I was like, oh, okay, well, that's what happens. Mm. But what's been really interesting, I think I'm in the minority on this, where I'm like, well, he probably shouldn't have tweeted that. And I'm curious what you think about this. Because I'm kind of like, well... Now, this, now remember, mind you, uh, and since we're also talking about CNN, this happened, what, two weeks after the whole... Um, what's her name? Kathy Griffin. Kathy Griffin and the... Kathy, no, this is also yeah. So yeah, Kathy Griffin, yeah. who's this? Who's this quote unquote comedian? I don't find her funny. I've never found her funny. I agree. But she did this piece of performance art where she holds up the decapitated a, a decapitated mock head of President Trump. And I saw that. And I, as soon as as soon as that went out, I posted about it. I was like, that's entirely inappropriate. Right. And then same thing. A lot of people defended her. But anyway, she lost her gig at CNN too. And and you know. The whole thing is like, well, they did much worse about President Obama. I say, yeah, it wasn't good when they did it to him either. And I'm kind of like, if you're going to be uh, claiming the higher ground, you have to you have to embody the higher ground. And I think part of that is is being aware of the language you use and who you represent. I mean, Reza Aslan, I don't I don't doubt for one second how extremely intelligent he is. But yeah. this was a bonehead move that he did, and and it sucks what happened. But he should have no, no. I, I didn't see it coming, Frank. I mean, with, with, with the with uh, the Kathy Griffin uh, Griffith Griffin 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 um, thing. I mean, it was it was it was it was distasteful. It it just it was over the top, and and every, everything that she sort of came her way. I said, you know, I I, I thought it was appropriate. With, with Reza Aslan, I feel like yeah, the reaction has been a little over the top. Like I, I think that he could have been maybe reprimanded in some form, but uh, to be like sort of. You know, some summarily dismissed or fired from CNN seems to me a bit excessive. I mean, the thing that we have to realize yeah. is that you I, know, I'm not even holding him to the standard of like a private citizen, right? Because if, as a private citizen, he has every right to exactly take to right. Twitter and exactly. and use yeah and describe the pre, you know pre, president in any terms. And you might get a visit from the Secret Service if you cross the line, but that's this that's you as a private citizen. You know, you know he's what, not a private citizen. But you he's know a public figure. Think about this for a second, right. Right? because because this is where we get to. And Reza Aslan is a, is a college professor. He knows this, right? Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's the nuances in language, mm-hmm. reasons, right? So say uh, say for a second, Reza Aslan says, "Man, what a shitty thing to do." Mm-hmm. Would he have gotten fired? No. Probably not, yeah. right? Right. So in other words, it's like yeah. maybe just take a second, man. Because because it's the coarseness of it, yeah, right. And th- this is this is the point I'm making, right? I, I, it's fine. I say this in my classes. I'm like, uh, freedom of speech is not freedom from consequences, right? Mm. Freedom of speech is not freedom from criticism. Hmm, interesting. Right? You know, I, I was just, I guess, while you were talking, I was also thinking about the fact that what does this have to like? The fact that it's CNN, what does that mean? The the, the funny <laughs> thing is that a lot of the narrative I'm seeing online. 
is what I feel like Muslim grievance, where it's like, oh, it's because he's a Muslim that he did it. And it's like, no, it's because he's a media personality that's on right. the left. The I'm Muslim part is completely incidental I to this. Agree. You know, and I, I think that's like, we, we got to, there's legitimate Muslim grievances. This isn't one of them. This isn't one of them. You know, and I think that that's no. like needlessly chumming right. up the waters. You know, right. I think CNN is in a tough position because the truth is that, you know, they, I mean, this is just sort of the unfair landscape we're in, right? Because they have this guy, this talking head, what's his name, Jeffrey Lord, yeah. who's, I mean, he he is paid to be a Trump supporter. That's right. So it's he's a paid Trump supporter. Well, you pay me. I'll be a Trump supporter if you pay me enough. Sure. I'll go on TV and just spout whatever nonsense. It's fine. It's, it's intellectually dishonest. Yeah. That's a separate kind. Of, but people, again, making these linkages. Like, oh, well, how can they keep Jeffrey Lord on? Look, CNN, they're... Right now, CNN is serving an important role, which is that they have investigative journalists who are investigating. Yeah. And so I think that as a result, they need to keep their noses extra clean because every news organization is on the hunt for stories here. Uh-huh. Not because they're trying to bring down this administration, but but they're, because they're doing what journalists are supposed to do. Right. Now, if you leave yourself open for, well, what about, like, they obviously have a clear bias against because of this and the other. I mean, it, it's hard to do what you're going to do then, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Their job is, is you know, and we can, we, can, we can criticize CNN for leaning sort of too far backwards to not appear biased at all. That's right. right. That's, that's, just come across that's, as that's a conversation. Yeah, yeah. You know what? Um, I, I, I don't blame CNN. I blame Rosa Osman for that. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't, I don't think they're wrong for, for, for canceling the show. Right? Yeah, yeah. I, I again I, I guess and that's and by the way I'm a fan of Reza Aslan I have I've been an admirer of his for more than a decade at this point so. I think he's good at what he is. like yeah I think he plays a very important role vis-a-vis like I think he's a he's a wonderful spokesperson for Islam and Muslims as far as the media is, is goes and and as as uh as citizens, not not necessarily coming at Islam from a scholarly. Oh, exactly. Yeah, I want to. I think a lot right. of people ascribe. I want to make. Yeah, exactly. I was just about to go there, which is like, but as far as like him being a scholar of Islam or something, I think those are those claims are a little bit dubious. Not yeah. that he himself makes them. Just anybody who does yeah. sort of perceive him that way, I think those, that, that that's that's, that's problematic. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, I guess since we're also talking about media or the media, another person who seems to every now and then circle back around and get himself into trouble, was um, Bill Maher. Oh, yeah, Bill Maher. Bill Maher dropping the N-word. Who's uh, Bill Maher? Uh, less uh, and less so. Yeah? Yeah. It's funny, because I, I... I have a love... And, I, I guess I have a love-hate relationship with Bill Maher. I'll be really honest. I... It's funny, because I can think... I 2003, I saw his uh, HBO show, which had just started... I'd write right. time. Because he, uh, he had been on Politically Incorrect. I liked him on Politically Incorrect when he was on... Comedy I never watched Central. Politically Incorrect. He was on Comedy Central yeah. first, was on ABC. Yeah. It was very funny. Uh, but it wasn't as overtly political... As to the, to, real time. To, to, yeah, uh, real time. Even though, I mean, it was a political show. But I, right. think, I think the times were less, like, insane, you know? Yeah. And I, I don't know right. if I would have thought that then, but definitely with, maybe there's a little bit of rose-colored glasses. Yeah, yeah. But I, I've felt all along that he has... As much as I agree with like ninety percent of his politics, yeah. he has a massive, massive blind spot when it comes to Islam. And to me, that's like that's like the goat turd in the milk. I know, I know. You know, I agree. And 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 that blind spot has just gotten wider and wider. And he's he, he's gotten more and more smug. Where he has this anti. Well, that's, 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 I wanted to say, like, as a Muslim. Oh, sorry, go, go, why don't you finish your point? Well, he, he, give you my reaction. He's, I'll he's, answer the question. He brandishes his anti-religious. Like, I'm against all religions. Okay, fair enough. But, and I'm paraphrasing here, but this is basically what he said. He's like, all religions suck, but Islam sucks the worst. Exactly. Right? And it's like, you know, dude, stop. You know, and, and, and it's one of those things where if if you're unwilling to allow yourself the intellectual elasticity to, to see um, how smug you're being, yeah. then to me that colors every other opinion you have. No mm-hmm. matter how much I might be inclined to agree with it. Mm-hmm. Right, because it's kind of, it's one of those things where it's like he's somebody who would be sitting in judgment of me. Yeah, and that you know that's like well I don't need this. You know? <laughs> right, but anyway, he got into some trouble last week. Yeah, no, uh, sorry, I want to quickly kind of yeah, respond yeah. as well to what you asked me. Like, am I a fan? So uh, I'm with you. Ninety percent of 
more often than not, I find myself in agreement with Bill Maher than I, than I, than I, than I tend to disagree with him. But as far as his views in Islam, I consider uh, abhorrent, uh, and and I just it, 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 again, it, I find it so baffling that the, a, a person I mean, it's, can it's, be intellectual and can be uh, I- I- inquisitive uh, about as far as other things go is so close minded when yeah. it comes to religion and 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 is like and is impervious to facts about the about the and, religion. And again, it's the smugness of uh, right. But to your yeah, and then there's the second aspect of, of my views on, on on Bill Maher is that even when I do agree with him the, or the stuff that I do agree with him on, there is a sort of level of smugness about yeah. him yeah. that if I were not in agreement with him politically, I would find yeah, oh. you, you know what I mean? Deep like what what's the word? I would find. Um, Condescending, I would find uh, dismissive of yeah. me, and so he, so for him, so I think that because of, I think it's the smugness that has gotten him, gotten him into trouble more than his abhorrent views yeah. on any given matter, whether it's Islam or, any, or religion well, or anything else for that matter. Just, just like a week ago, he's on his show yeah. and he's talking to a Republican uh, senator. It was a senator whose name I, escapes me. Yes, yeah. terrible, but yeah. it was promoting a new book and. In the context of what they're saying, um, uh, the senator's like, oh, you should go out and do this or whatever. I, I missed the point. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, the, the, what the, he, like, what what was Bill Martin it, responding it, to? It was like uh, going out and being active. And, oh, okay. Got in, it. In some uh, regards. I see. And he says, Senator, I'm a house and N-word. N-word. And and then you know it's just something obviously that we know. Well, it's not a word that you use, especially if you're not uh, uh, black. Not you know? black, yeah. Right, and so that stirred up some controversy, and and it was what what he and he apologized shortly thereafter, and you know it became a thing, and and Ice Cube was on. Well, hold on. Then there was there was calls of you know to for HBO to fire him, which I knew HBO was not going to do. And I thought that was over the top. Yeah. Um, in spite of, again... And then people are like, oh, they fired Riz Aslan, but they didn't fire... It's like, well, two different companies. <laughs> right. Two different organizations. I mean, they're all owned by the same company because they're both uh, Time Warner, but... Ah, uh, okay. But regardless... So they're going to react differently. I mean, that's but, neither yeah, here but, nor but, there. Yeah, but the thing is... And, and then, so then he was on his... Sort of, sort of last night's episode... Or sorry, this past Friday's episode was meant to be the sort of episode that was meant to redeem him. The, uh, yeah, which I don't know that, that necessarily. There we go. So but he the, brought out Ice Cube. The redemptive episode. Well, he first brings out Professor um, Miles Eric, Eric Dyson. Huh? Miles Eric Dyson. Exactly, exactly. Eric Dyson. Um, and then he brings out, yeah, uh, Ice Cube. Ice Cube, yeah. 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 And, Ice, and Ice Cube made a very I thought Ice Cube argument. Was great. talked about that. that uh, Michael Eric Dyson, by the way, not Miles. I was like, Miles. Did you say Miles? I Miles Dyson, like the character from Terminator 2. That's not. That's Michael Eric. <laughs> That's right. But but Ice Cube, Betty and I talked about the that word as a weapon, That's and right. it was used against us. We're not going to let you use it against us anymore. That's and it's very right. profound. And then of course, oh well, Ice Cube is a misogynist or whatever, like all this stuff, right? Chumming the waters up again. It's like yeah, but it doesn't fundamentally change what he said. But here's the thing. But I frankly, his apology was so even his it apology. It was a half-hearted apology. It was, and it was kind of like, why aren't people getting over this? Even his reaction to even his reaction to he's Ice like Cube, the point has been made exactly. And Ice Cube says, "Not by me." Yeah, that right. was nice. And but that it's that smugness that I'm talking about yeah. because even in his response to Ice Cube, sort of quote unquote reprimanding, in which he invited him to do, because he's like, "Now it's your turn." And but here's the thing: because when you look at the video of when when Bill Maher said it, yeah. He knew, right? I, I was just like, it, it came out of his mouth so casually. Yeah. What struck me was, this is somebody who says a lot. Mm. That was what struck me. Because I was like, I I don't think I could be in a public situation and even say it. Right. You know what I mean? Because I'd be like... But context is important. So he... as re- I agree with you that there was there was no sort of reticence or... Whatever we may say, like that. He wasn't like, Ooh, "Oops, yeah, yeah." It exactly. wasn't, and it, again, it, but it, this it, idea of the house and word and the field and word. I mean, these are these are tropes, and that in and of itself is like the, the notion that this is really interesting right? because the idea that somehow the slaves who lived in the house were high on the hog. Like, there's a whole sociological thing there. Agreed. We can unpack the history, but yeah. what I'm seeing is... That in and of itself... You would recognize, though, that, it, 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 that in terms of usage, 
in popular, I don't want to say popular culture, but in, in terms of usage of, of, that, of those terms, there is an understanding that that the house and we're but I don't think, think context appeal. matters in this case. Okay. If he had said, I'm a house N-word. Yeah. Which is what he said. No. If he said N-word. Okay. Would there have been as much controversy? Okay. I don't think there would have. Oh, I see what you're saying. Right. Right. If he had said, I'm a house Negro, would there have been as much controversy? No. Eh, probably not. Probably not. Right? It's that word. That word, that's fascinating because that word. You're right. There and is think, no context. You no, know, no, it's funny. Even mentally, as I'm saying it. I kept saying house N word and and field N word, but it was really like it, I mean even the term There's as they were used word. by like say when like even Malcolm used it, it was house Negro and field Negro. Wasn't the yeah you don't you don't yeah right, that's right. and there is no context in which that word is acceptable is acceptable. It's funny because I, I I was you know on social media I was having this discussion. People show up. Well, I'm, I should be able to use it, and I'm like I think you just really want to use that word and not feel bad about it. Like why? What is it about you that what is your deal? You got a whole bunch of other words you can use. Why this word? What is your deal that you just must be able to use this word? Yeah. Right? What What is it about your pathology that refuses to acknowledge that, well, there's some words I shouldn't use? Right. You know? I don't even have David Gregory on. I don't know what happened. No, 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 not David Gregory. Who am I thinking of? The comedian. The old... Uh... I'm not sure. Anyway, yeah. David Gregory, not a comedian. He's late of uh, Meet the Press, I think. Right? Yeah, not that guy. No, no, no. Anyway, it will come to me. So, sorry. But, but you know, yeah. it's, it's it's been a busy month, I guess what I'm saying. I mean, this has been an interesting <laughs> conversation to have just about, the, I mean, gosh, we've covered a lot of ground. We have. We have. Um, I, I, five, 50 episodes, man. What do you think? Well, you know, I... But what is this as an anniversary goes? Well, uh, yeah, I don't know. What did you get me? <laughs> What did you get me? Well, we got this beautiful new microphone that we're recording from. So that ain't That's nothing. true. That's you true. know, 50 episodes we've been doing this, and, and uh, the truth is, uh, this this all started, uh, ultimately, I've said it before, because uh, Pervez and I like hanging out and we like talking, and the conversation that we just had that you uh, listened to, that's the type of stuff that uh, we would have been talking Dick about. Gregory. Dick, Dick Gregory. Dick Gregory. Dick Gregory. Dick Gregory. Who is that? You, you know Dick Gregory, yeah. I do know Dick yeah, Gregory. you will. Oh, man. Anyway, sorry. I'm going to um, kick myself. No. But yeah, I mean, I mean, this is the type of conversation that we would have had, like, uh, you know, over dinner, mm -hmm. just hanging out. So That's the fact right. that people enjoy what we're doing on the show, and to whatever small extent we're able to put a voice on aspects of the Muslim experience, because we, we're not, we're not uh, egotistical enough to say that we encompass the totality of it. All we're doing is sort of skimming over the surface of the many, many facets of it. Mm -hmm. um, but with that in mind, I wanted to share some uh, listener letters that we've gotten uh, real quick. We, we've been sort of remiss in responding to feedback. Yeah. So uh, this is from Zan Asif via our Facebook page. And he says, Asalaamu Alaikum, Zaki Uncle, and Pervez Uncle. I don't know who you are, Zane, but you just made us uncles, too. I'm an uncle? I'm a dad, so I guess I'm an uncle. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I like to think of myself as the hip younger brother. There you go, exactly. And now suddenly we're in the uncle category. Yeah, it happens. Yeah. I've only recently discovered this podcast through my brother, and after listening to a few episodes, my view on my faith and the world has dramatically changed. I haven't caught up completely, but alhamdulillah, the work you guys are doing is amazing. I'm very thankful that there's a platform on which intelligent and learned individuals discuss these imperative issues and what the current and future state of the Muslim American community is and will be. Not only is there spiritual guidance, which has helped me tremendously, but also abundant political, social, and historical information about our religion and spirituality. I just wanted to thank you, too, and whoever else helps with this podcast for putting out such quality material and exposing all of us listeners to these amazing Muslim Americans. Being a 20-year-old college student, it helps inform me about the world and how to react to xenophobic remarks in light of the recent election. Once again, may Allah bless you guys and hope to see more awesome material. Wow, thank you, Zane. Yeah, that, that really uh, uh, puts in perspective what we're doing. We, we, yeah, which is, yeah, we usually get, like, it, it's funny, when we do get to uh, engage um, people who do the responses, I, I, it's always overwhelming in terms of the, like, the, the fact that the audience is responding to exactly the kind of intentionality behind the show that Zucky and I put into it in terms of wanting to have those conversations like Zucky you were saying earlier, but also to bring these amazing people onto the show and, and share their stories. Um, and so 
yeah, I mean, to, to have people like Zane and other listeners respond the way they do is always always overwhelming, and uh, we're, we are really grateful. And this is from James Coulter, again through Facebook. He says, love the show, guys. Keep up the great work. The show is a great resource for American Muslim slash Muslim American dialogue, especially important in today's climate. Anyway, just wanted to take a quick second to reach out. And, Thank you know, you James. Yeah, it's, it's, again, we've, uh, you know, over the past uh, uh, four years that we've been doing this show, uh, yeah, four years. the guests we've had on, the, the people we've, we've uh, been privileged to sort of share oxygen with, <laughs> and, and uh, the people who have shown that they listen to the show that we didn't know anything about. Oh, yeah. It's extraordinary. So, really, thanks to everybody. It's It's been a great 50, but we've got a lot of fun stuff planned. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, you know, speaking of uh, engaging us, I mean, please do continue to reach out to us. I know we, we might be a little late and, and at times responding, but we'll try to be better about that. Um, speaking of Facebook, I just noticed that we actually have, we just crossed, I mean, you think I mean, it's no major feat, but... Uh, we just crossed, I think, a thousand people who like oh, the page great. and follow the page. Wow. Please do share and continue to share. I always tell people, uh, one of the things, uh, you know, I, when I do encounter people who are like, oh, big fan of the show, I'm like, you know, well, first thing I do is thank them, obviously, for listening, but also thank them or encourage them to kind of share, spread, spread the word. And, 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 just, the be- and the best way to spread the word, go yeah. to iTunes and punch in Diffuse Congruence, find our show, leave a review, leave a star rating, every little bit helps. Uh, even if it's just a word or two, uh, the more reviews we have, the more visibility the show is going to have, and that's going to be beneficial uh, in, in a whole host of different ways. Yeah. Uh, Pervez, where can people reach out to us other than Facebook? That's right. So uh, please email us uh, comments, suggestions, um, you know, requests. We're also getting requests for... Uh, a lot of great guest requests, by the way. We're not yeah. ignoring any of those. That's We're, right. Thank you exactly for saying that. That's exactly what I was referring to, which is uh, diffusecongruence at gmail.com. Um, to, you know, send us thoughts, send us suggestions, and so on, and we'll, you know, and we do try to be timely in responding to that. Um, of course, you can also reach us on Facebook, facebook.com slash diffusecongruence, and uh, leave us uh, a comment, and we will try to respond there as well. And of course, like Zeki was saying, go to iTunes. And uh, leave us a star rating, leave us a review. That is how we get more visible or more visibility about the show. So we are very, uh, very helpful by that. It was was very, it helps us a lot. It helps the show a lot. And we want to be able to continue to do this. So thank you. Yeah. And uh, if you're, if you're looking to reach out to uh, me on Twitter, I'm at Zucky's Corner, the AKI's Corner. Uh, that's also on my website, just com. You can also find me at the Huffington Post. You can find me uh, at a variety of different places. The Movie Film Podcast is also at iTunes and the Nostalgia Theater Show. Please check those out, too, if you're interested. Uh, that's more from me. And Pervez is on Twitter at... A very long name. That's right. The New Madha. But, but, the New Madha. People t- tend just, to find just, me, though. Just search yeah. for Pervez. Pervez Ahmed, then you'll find me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. And and, uh, and and people do, because they do hit us up on, Facebook, on, uh, on Twitter. About liking the show, so there you go. So that's this has been episode fifty. Stay with us for the next fifty and beyond, inshallah. This has been Diffusing Grunts. Thanks for listening.